Thank thanks you. to you at home for joining us this hour. Rachel is off, and we'll be back tomorrow. I am Ari Melber, and we have a lot for you on this very busy evening in the impeachment probe on Capitol Hill. It was exactly three weeks ago today that Nancy Pelosi announced Congress was moving forward with an official impeachment inquiry sparked by the revelation that President Trump had pressured a foreign government to gin up dirt on one of his political rivals and would go on to admit it. Today, lawmakers returned to Capitol Hill from a two-week recess, during which most of them went back to their districts and began to hear what their constituents actually have to say with full-blown impeachment proceedings going on. Announced, what does everyone think? And this period of time has not exactly been static. Members were meeting with constituents as this new and damning evidence has continued to come out about Donald Trump, about Ukraine, about Rudy Giuliani. So right now, this evening is actually the first time that all of those House Democrats returned and met privately since all of this to discuss what do they do now, including discussing whether or not to hold a full House vote on triggering the impeachment inquiry. That's something President Trump has been taunting the Democrats to do. Experts note it is not legally necessary to initiate any probe. And that makes this all kind of a Washington debate over whether this thing that the Trump White House claims is the reason for their stonewalling should even be entertained. As we watch these Democrats, you see them here just filing out late today around 7 p.m. That was part of the debate they were discussing. Trump and his White House counsel insisting impeachment is currently illegitimate without a vote and thus they won't cooperate. But of course, these Democrats you see on your screen and a heck of a lot of other people already know the White House has been resisting cooperation in all kinds of congressional probes regardless of any new vote or potential vote. Tonight, the vice president says he won't comply with the document request, noting this is a, quote, purported impeachment inquiry. Ditto from the White House budget office. And then the Pentagon chief, who said they would comply, but is now, as you see here, rejecting a House subpoena at this time. And then there's Rudy Giuliani, the focus of these new prosecutorial subpoenas late today. Well, he also dispatched a lawyer to say that he, Giuliani, is rebuffing the House subpoena. And then Giuliani's lawyer promptly quit his job as Giuliani's lawyer today. More on that story later in this show. So what you see is obviously a unified message. But I can tell you right now, the facts show there are not unified results for the Stonewalling. As you may have noticed, while these letters are all flying around, many of the people who worked for Trump are going right ahead and showing up to Congress and testifying and providing evidence in writing, documents, texts, and they're telling stories. After tonight's meeting of the Democratic caucus, Speaker Pelosi said there won't be any official vote soon. Now, in just a moment, we'll be joined here on The Rachel Maddow Show by two members of the House Intelligence Committee in the room for that meeting. It'll be interesting to see what they have to say about that, as well as the other drama unfolding on the Hill. This ever-growing parade of former and current senior Trump officials who are not defying subpoenas, who are appearing as witnesses in this very real impeachment proceeding, defying the administration's attempts to block their testimony. House Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff, who was the only other Democrat who spoke today in addition to the Speaker, he came out, he is leading this impeachment inquiry, and listen to this brand new update he gave on what he thinks they're getting from those witnesses. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wanted to give you a brief update on the investigation. Uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks, I think we've made dramatic progress in uh, answering some of the questions surrounding that July telephone call between President Trump and President Zelensky in which the President of the United States uh, sought to coerce a vulnerable ally into uh, conducting, uh, I think, what can best be described as sham investigations involving his opponent uh, and into involving a debunked conspiracy theory about the 2016 election. We have learned that call was not in isolation. There was a great deal of preparatory work that was done before the call. There was a lot of follow-up work that was done after the call. Um, and we have learned much of this thanks to the courageous testimony of State Department officials um, who have been put in an impossible situation by the administration, and that is urged not to comply with the law, urged not to comply with a lawful subpoena by the U.S. Congress. And they are doing their duty. Um, and people should make no mistake about that. They are doing exactly 
what they are required to do. And I think showing enormous courage. So we've been bringing witnesses in at quite a furious pace. Uh, that pace is only accelerating. We've got a very busy few days and, and weeks ahead. Busy, and the witnesses have a lot to say. You know, today it was diplomat George Kent, a senior State Department official in charge of Ukraine policy. He left the Capitol, and you see here on our news cameras, the gentleman in the bow tie, after more than 10 hours of testimony. He was part of the pushback inside state against the president's actions, as well as the appeals of his allies that have led to the impeachment inquiry. Earlier this year, President Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and his associates were trying to oust the ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch, because she was not playing ball with the efforts to get the Ukrainian government to go after Biden. Now, about those documents that are hitting Congress, well, some from the state's inspector general support that very account, showing Kent warning about the campaign all the way back in March, flagging internal emails about, quote, fake news driven smear out of Ukraine. Kent also writing then, and this was before he knew all this would spill out in public or he'd be telling Congress about it. He was putting in writing that the smear of the ambassador was complete poppycock. Today, Kent said that when his warnings were ignored, he was also told to lay low, the Washington Post reporting, and basically corroborating this idea from testimony that he was supposed to defer to people who look, by any reasonable accounting, like the Trump loyalists left in the plot. Rick Perry, Gordon Sondland, and someone they thought at the time was in on this, Court Volcker. In fact, at the time, those three referred to themselves as, quote, the three amigos. Now, that's their lingo. That's their terminology. I'm guessing Sondland would be Steve Martin. Volcker, clearly Martin Short. And that leaves Perry as the putative Chevy Chase. But only they know for sure. Email chatter and lingo aside, there's way more here because Kent is a current high-ranking State Department official. And the stonewalling strategy would, of course, apply to him, right? He got orders from the Trump administration to defy this very request to talk to these impeachment investigators. Now, stuck between that Trump directive and what became this lawful last-minute subpoena from the House, he spoke. That's why the stonewalling's not working this week. And this is important. He's not alone in that. When you just count up what's happening, former Ambassador Jovanovich, still employed at state, but she rejected the Trump request, and we saw her march in there complying with the House subpoena and gave blistering testimony Friday about how the president yanked her from her post. Same for Fiona Hill. She was Trump's, of course, top White House advisor on Russia and Ukraine. Pretty key stuff. And while she's not still an employee, she also got the request to stop or wait. And I want to be clear here, as you look at this, those are not automatically bankrupt requests. When a White House argues that someone is a top advisor to the president and says there are issues of executive privilege, which is what they claimed here in normal administrations, when a White House says that, it buys you time immediately, if not wiping out the entire deposition. And a lot of diplomats err on the side of respecting those kind of requests from a sitting president. Most of these diplomats are career public servants, and they are proudly cautious. But these are not normal times. Ms. Hill apparently saw where this was headed and made her choice. She had her lawyers clap back at the White House, rejecting any argument that executive privilege would apply to the very things that she was going to discuss, and pointedly noting that even if executive privilege could apply, which, as I mentioned, in normal times, it could. She went to the heart of the issue and said that privilege would still, quote, disappear altogether when there's any reason to believe government misconduct occurred, adding prior presidents have largely agreed that executive privilege operates differently in the context of an impeachment inquiry. Wow. Wow. That is spoken like someone more concerned about getting their evidence before the impeachment inquiry than trying to hold on to a government career. Hill's deposition took place behind closed doors, but even from the little that we got through reporting about what she said, it is still reverberating all across Washington. If her lawyer's letter was abnormal and tough, her actual testimony blew the roof off. And this is where we get to the talk of Giuliani as a walking hand grenade, pitching a criminal conspiracy inside the White House. Again, their words. New York Times reported it out as follows. Last summer, Trump's then national security advisor, John Bolton, got into a tense exchange with Gordon Sondland, the Trump donor turned ambassador to the EU, who was working with Rudolph Giuliani, the president's personal lawyer, 
to press Ukraine to investigate Democrats, according to three people who heard the testimony from Ms. Hill. Hill testified that Mr. Bolden told her to notify the chief lawyer for the NSC about a rogue effort by Sondland, Giuliani and Mulvaney, of course, chief of staff. The rogue effort reportedly blurted out by Sondland at a White House meeting with Ukrainian officials in which Sondland told them the new Ukrainian president could secure a meeting with Trump if, look at this, if Ukraine opened up the investigations the White House was seeking. Bolton told Hill to tell the White House lawyers, quote, I'm not part of whatever drug deal Sondland and Mulvaney are cooking up. And further went on, quote, Giuliani is a hand grenade who's going to blow everybody up. Hill told lawmakers she considered what was happening to be a clear counterintelligence risk to the country, according to NBC reporting. Cooking up a drug deal. It's not every day that John Bolton sounds like he's quoting Migos in the kitchen, wrist twisting like it's stir fry, a reference to twisting while one cooks cocaine. But Mr. Bolton, a Yale-educated lawyer, was trying to be as dramatic and clear as possible to his own Trump colleagues that he was worried about a crime here. And for all the rhetoric, let's be clear, he was worried about a crime far worse than drug dealing. And that's why he ordered the top national security lawyer be brought in. Now, big picture, these witnesses, this evidence, it's also giving these impeachment committees brand new leads to follow as Congress returns to session. Lawmakers now considering whether to call in, of course, Mr. Bolton as a witness so they can get his own words that have been memorialized and that are so damning about the hand grenade and the drug deal. Then there's, of course, Mr. Sondland. He's slated to testify on Thursday. And there are reports already that he's planning to say to say to the Congress under penalty of perjury that Trump told him directly there was no quid quo quo with Ukraine, exchanging, say, military aid for dirt on Biden. But Sondland, quick to emphasize, he doesn't know whether that's true. He doesn't know whether the president was lying. He is distancing himself from that one written defense. And while the Pentagon and the Office of Management Budget are refusing to comply with some of these subpoenas, the House committees expanding their witness lists deep into those departments, which suggests that the alleged military aid quid pro quo theory is a focus. They've asked two Pentagon officials to testify, one scheduled to appear Friday. They're also asking for Trump's budget director to appear. So this is all about what Mr. Bolton and these other witnesses have said they saw going on in real time. And the Congress is saying, forget your stonewalling. As Adam Schiff said tonight, the witnesses are still coming in and at a furious pace. There is a lot happening on the Hill. I'm thrilled that we have Kyle Cheney, congressional reporter for Politico here, who has been all over this. Um, good evening on a busy night. Thanks for making time for us. Great to be here, Ari. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. As we see these witnesses come forward, including uh, Mr. Kent from the State Department today, we're also seeing the stonewalling from Giuliani and some of those other entities we mentioned. Um, when you look at all of this and the evidence coming forward through the cooperative witnesses, um, wh what does that tell you? And is that advancing the ball enough? I mean, there are a lot of Democrats in particular who say they've already got enough evidence. They can move to the floor with articles of impeachment today if they wanted to. But I think actually the conundrum they have now is how much evidence do we need? And, and is there a point where we've actually crossed a line where we have enough to say, look, this is This could take us years to get to the bottom of every single lead that we have that's emerging. Um, so should we put a lid on it and actually draft articles of impeachment based on what we know? What do you think is the significance it, of what sounds like John Bolton seeing around the corner, perhaps earlier than other individuals there. We don't know all the details around his departure. He and the president got into a war of who was telling the truth about just that issue. This is a more important right. one. Um, but does your reporting and what you're hearing on the Hill suggest that Mr. Bolton thought it's only a matter of time before this all, to quote him, blows up? Well, absolutely. And I think the, the importance of Fiona Hill's testimony is that she placed John Bolton at the center of this controversy. She puts it for the first time at a level that's not just senior ambassadors, but people in the president's inner circle uh, really having personal, uh, you know, personal qualms about what's happening here and raising concerns to a, a National Security Council lawyer. I mean, she she expanded what was already a really uh, devastating scandal for the White House to the people that were, you know, one degree removed from the president. So it gave the House investigators so many more avenues to pursue. And Bolton is almost surely going to get called. 
Yeah, you say that she placed him there. I don't know if you ever played the board game Clue. <laughs> Have you? Oh, yes. It oh, sounds yes, a little bit <laughs> like that, like Mr. Bolton <laughs> in the Oval Office with the telephone. It, it, you're placing different figures, and then especially if they're out of government, uh, do you expect him to then have to testify? Because there aren't a lot of arguments left, as we've just reported, uh, if they're talking mm -hmm. about what he himself called a drug deal. Well, wh what we're seeing is, you know, Fiona Hill and, you know, Marie Yovanovitch have laid out a template for officials who want to testify to essentially override uh, the White House, the State Department, trying to get them to stop. Um, and so where in the past witnesses who have been unwilling have used that as a shield, uh, witnesses who are really motivated to talk to Congress can now... Uh, look to what they've done and say, well, you can try to stop me, but I have a way around that, and I have a way to at least get the pertinent information to this impeachment inquiry to lawmakers who can do something with it. What will be important to hear from Mr. Sondland? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, so much of his testimony has kind of been previewed in news reports. Uh, he's going to suggest, essentially, if the reports are correct, that uh, there was a quid pro quo. In fact, he, he'll say, apparently, that it was not a corrupt quid pro quo, but that's not really up to him to decide. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, sort of put uh, raise questions about the narrative that the White House has been putting out there, partly based on Sondland's own text messages. Uh, so he's going to sort of take away uh, the, the bludgeon the White House has been using to defend against the arguments that the president was doing something corrupt. Politico's Kyle Cheney, thank you so much. This is quite a story. Great to be here. Appreciate you, sir. This is a busy news night. And up ahead, we're going to speak live to, as I mentioned, two members of the House Intelligence Committee who were there when Mr. Kent testified and when Ms. Hill testified yesterday. They join us live here next. Stay with us. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.